Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 763. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's October 4th, 2022. All right, thank you for joining us for another program of Anglican Unscripted, a program you can find on the internet in both podcast and video form. Obviously, you're watching the video. If you don't want to watch us in video, please go to the show notes on YouTube and you can click the download link for our podcast and you can sign up there. If you get a chance, please like this episode on YouTube or Facebook. And if you want to be part of the show and you should be part of the show, you go to the comment section and you tell us what you think. That's a very important feature that we offer on Anglican Unscripted. Uh, George, I see that there's lots of hurricane recovery going on in Florida. The weather's starting to get nicer. Uh, how are you doing? Well, uh, we're doing great. The weather's beautiful. Life is wonderful. 125 miles to the south. Um, they're pitching in and uh, beginning the hard work of recovery. I think the uh, death toll is now up to about 90. Um, we have uh, acquaintances, parishioners uh, who have family down there. Uh, for instance, uh, our deacon, Deacon Gale, has a very close friend who is a retired uh, high school teacher who had a duplex condo that she bought on the beach in Fort Myers Beach. And she decided to ride out the storm. It was a two-story condo. And that entire building has been washed away. Mm. And the she would get texts from her friend, this is bad, was the last text that she had. And so she's posted as missing. Oh, and no. oh. so she will most likely be dead because the, her building is gone. Um, we have another, we have a family that just moved up here from Cape Coral. And he, uh, uh, his name's Ralph, and Ralph went down with a trailer load of baby wipes, diapers, bottled water for his neighborhood. Um, and we're seeing that sort of spontaneous neighbor reach out to neighbor uh, work happening. Um, yes, it's a tragedy. But at the same time, we're seeing the best of people coming out in this time of tragedy. We're seeing uh, people. I have uh, my LEM, my lay Eucharistic minister at the 1030 service, wasn't here on Sunday. It's because he's a Duke Power lineman. And we have another Duke Power lineman who's uh, uh, in, the, in the congregation. They're working 18 hours a day, living in the back of their, tra in the back of their uh, trucks, fixing the power lines, getting work back. And there are trucks from Kentucky, uh, the Northeast. Uh, you can see them on the highways driving south. It's a tragedy, but at the same time, Florida will recover. The people are recovering. There's a good spirit. There's no grumbling. There's no bitterness. Um, the governor is extraordinarily popular. Uh, it really is funny to see the national news try to tear him down, but when you, the man in the street just sort of sees the governor and the state as being a helper. Um, so in the mass, mass, midst of this tragedy, uh, Florida, I think, will come out of this much stronger, more unified than ever before. Yeah, watching the video from uh, Hurricane Ian, I'm kind of surprised that the loss of life is as low as it is. I know there's still a lot more missing uh, the people are in shelters and stuff. They haven't they tracked them all down, or they they f fled to hotels, and the authorities just don't know who where they are right now. But uh, to limit this to so far a hundred deaths, when you know a whole beach community was just completely wiped out, uh, you know, it, it, Sanibel Island, of course, uh, is gone, and uh, Fort Myers Beach. It, it's hard to watch, but we will rebuild, and this is a unifying thing amongst. Uh, uh, Americans, when a tragedy happens, we all pitch in. What do you need for help? And I remember we, watching this in Sandy when Sandy hit the Northeast. Uh, people and neighbors they they go run to U-Haul, they go to Home Depot, fill it full of all the uh, home supplies, and drive it down to uh, where Sandy hit the beaches in uh, New Jersey. It's just amazing how we pull together. We have uh, another prisoner who has a brother. Who lived? Who lives in a uh, trailer park in Fort Myers? That's just in back of the uh, shrimp boat docks, and 
in the midst of the storm, he didn't evacuate uh, because he thought, well, there's a barrier island and we've got the docks and this is sort of, you know, three feet above water. It never floods here. Well, uh, in the midst of the storm, 20 people plus their dogs and cats took refuge in the second story apartment of the uh, community manager. And they rode out the storm there um, because that was the one cinder block building. The rest are trailers and uh, mobile homes. But, you know, 20 people survived the storm, uh, you know, due to the kindness of the community manager who didn't leave and lock his room. He, you know, he stayed to take care of his uh, tenants. But when the storm was over, one of the things was there were there was no mobile home park left. And there were eight, eight shrimp boats on top of what were once the uh, um, community. And there's a hundred thousand pounds of shrimp rotting uh, because, you know, all the uh, the storage units, the electricity's off. And so not only do you have the smell of decaying vegetation, you have the smell of, uh, what's that, 50 tons of fresh <laughs> shrimp. That. Yeah, uh, all the sewer uh, pumps are without electricity. I mean, it, it, it's not a comfortable situation uh, post-hurricane at all. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, watch the news. But uh, enough about that. Please uh, keep the people in Florida in your prayers. Uh, yeah, it's a, a great time to, to unify around a cause. But let, let's pray that God can be glorified in, in this and that we can start to fill the churches in Florida. All right, let's move on to some news, George, while we're doing the show. Uh, let's go over to Scotland. And uh, Bishop Ann Dyer, a bishop in the Church of Scotland, has been suspended pending trial. Now, Anne Dyer, we've talked about many times here. She's the bishop who doesn't drive. She was the bishop who was not voted in to be the bishop in Scotland. She was appointed because uh, she, she, well, she's a woman and the diocese was uh, anti-women's orders and uh, she's pro-gay and the diocese was kind of moderate on that. And the only way she would have got her job was to be appointed. And things are really kind of getting messy here. And I think we need to talk this out because what does a suspension mean over there and what is she accused of let's start with the, the bullying first george she's been accused of bullying Anne dyers the scottish episcopal church bishop of aberdeen and orkney mm-hmm. and she was not elected to that position she was appointed by the other bishops after the diocese failed to elect someone and the di- and the bishops pulled a fast one by putting a female liberal in the most conservative diocese in Scotland. And that, and I think they did that because they wanted a woman bishop and the the gang wasn't going to ever get elected in that diocese. So when they had an opportunity to have a token, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's get, let's get a woman among the bis- bishops and also stick a finger in the eye of the, the fellows in Aberdeen and Orkney. Well, and they did that because she has no parish experience. She doesn't drive. She needs a driver. And everyone she ran into, she fired. So she, at the, the substance is that she has no human or interpersonal skills. That Allegedly. She, allegedly. And she's a micromanager to the extent of how many rolls of toilet paper do we buy? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm being silly, but it's that level of micromanaging. She drove one person to the brink of suicide she reorganized the cathedral fired the one non-white uh or basically forced uh, out the one non-white clergyman in the diocese who was the cathedral dean so on and so forth just a bad bishop a bad person to be in charge of other people well complaints were laid and an investigation was done and by an outside group led by the former moderator of the Church of Scotland, which is the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. And this this group, this report found that she was guilty as charged, and they recommended she be gracefully retired. Well, the Scottish bishop said, thanks, but we'll, we'll opt for mediation and reconciliation. Well, in that period of mediation and reconciliation, Bishop Dyer then proceeded to make darn sure that all of her enemies were dead um it was sort of the scottish episcopal version of the climax of the godfather where you have all these people shot and murdered and bombed uh while uh, she's on her knees praying in church Mm -hmm. um well it didn't make it go away 
and charges were brought and finally they had to adopt the, the canonical process and it was stayed oddly enough maybe coincidentally until Lambeth was over to allow her to go on the uh, all all paid expenses trip to Canterbury but once she got back home the she was suspended because of the allegations then she was unsuspended because she complained now after a hearing the bishops have re-suspended her pending formal trial now one of the things this kind of reveals especially that people have been emailing us is the broken system uh they have for suspension and for uh i forget the, the word they use for this uh system but it, it's broken and bishops have been using it to prosecute persecute um clergy they don't like it this is uh, the scottish and english systems are very close and we're going to sort of segue into the church of england at this point mm -hmm. um Scotland is so small they don't have as many obvious blatant cases of political persecution as England does. The clergy disciplinary measure, CDM process, is let's say you have parishioners complain about you. The complaint's brought to the bishop, and the bishop, if he finds that they're grounds, he can institute a clergy disciplinary measure process. And it's very similar to these things around the world. You know, there's investigation, they interview witnesses, and so on and so forth. The bishop, though, has the option to suspend the priest if they think, at their discretion, if there's more fire than smoke. What have, this means is that politically outsiders who are, have a CDM brought against them will be suspended. And that suspension can last a year or two years. Now, everybody's, now, the church rules say this is a neutral measure to preserve the facts, to preserve the parties. But what it does, it destroys the reputation, it destroys the parish, and it's being used but again and again against uh, uh, English conservatives or against those outside the liberal establishment. Even Justin Welby used it against the Bishop of Lincoln. He suspended the Bishop of Lincoln for a year and a half, two years, until he basically said, never mind, uh, nothing here to see. But in the meantime, the Bishop of Lincoln's career was destroyed and his diocese basically in limbo. Cons uh, Gavin Ashenden, uh, when he was on the show a few years ago, told us when this was introduced that the CDM was designed, process was de suspension was designed to protect children and vulnerable people from predatory clergy. If you've got a child rapist in the, in the vicarage, you want, you want him stop it. Yeah. have no you want no stop him have him have no contact well it's not being used that way it's being used against those who are troublesome politically uh, objectionable and 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 we've uh, we've got some emails i've gotten some emails we've gotten some emails where people who say i have no sympathy for ann dyer she's not a good person to be a bishop but I'm glad she's suing the Scottish Episcopal Church over her suspension because it will shine light on the abuses in this process. So, yeah, um, the process is broken. It's been used for uh, politics now for a year and a half, two years. We have emails from uh, clergy who've been suspended. And they won't tell me why I've been suspended. And then after a year and a half, the investigation goes away and I'm returned to my church. My church doesn't want me because I've been suspended for a year and a half and they don't know why. You know, it's ruined my reputation. Or there's a general charge of uh, safeguarding violation. Yeah. And the assumption, but they won't say what exactly you did. And we, we reported on an English priest who brought abuse allegations to the attention of the diocese, and the diocese did nothing. Diocese of Southwark, Southwark as it's spelled. And he was suspended at, for telling... Uh, for speaking about the fact that this the diocese was was adoring at this this all so he was suspended for being a whistleblower under the measure used to suspend the perverts but nobody would explain the difference to his congregation and he happened to be a good priest who had the backing of his people but if, let's say he you know he had a mediocre congregation they'd walk away in a shot because it's you know guilt by association guilt by assumption no oh. What a great transition into our next 
uh, topic, guilt by association. Um, the last 10 years has revealed a lot about the intolerance of the left. Uh, you and I grew up in the 80s where um, the best part of politics was the debate. The ability to, to get up in front of a class in high school or college or uh, join a debate team or have your friends uh, go out for uh, uh, some drinks at a bar. You got to discuss any topic you wanted. And it was a, a vigorous debate of people with many opinions, not two opinions. There could be three, four, five opinions uh, at, at a table. And that was the, the, the glory of growing up in the, the 70s and 80s and early 90s. That time is over. Uh, we now have one opinion uh, being brought to us, is certainly in the West, Europe, and uh, here in America, and that's the opinion of the left. And we're seeing more and more intolerance, and I, I got the whole uh, list of stories here. But one of the things that you get, need to do is understand as a church, it's not the fault of the left. It's really the fault of the church and the moderates in our society who are, are refusing to say no. When? Somebody tells you that a man can give birth. It's your responsibility as a human who loves silence, who understands reason, who uh, understands creation and, and God to say, uh, no, if you believe that, would you provide a name of a person, a man who is given birth? And they'll say, well, trans men can give birth. And so, well, no, there are no trans men. There are women who've gone through surgical procedures to make themselves look like men, and some have maintained their womb. Well, they can give birth. Uh, I'll, I'll reasonably accept that. But um, we as as a church have, have kind of led us into this very horrible situation with the entire left, by not saying no, and I, and I would encourage you to start saying no. George, um, I have a uh, Facebook friend, Caroline Farrell, who is a uh, blogger over in England, and she has been arrested again uh, because she just said what I just said. And I'm not going to be arrested because I currently live in America, but over in England, they're becoming so much less tolerant for free political speech, George. I had a Kenyan, uh, one of our Kenyan viewers wrote to me, say, well, I feel very badly for Carolyn Farrow, but this is what the British did during the Mau Mau uprising, prevent that's tension. Right. Well, that's right. This, Whoa. you know, we have, uh, Carolyn Farrow was taken into preventative uh, detention. Hmm? Carolyn Farrow is the wife of an or ordinary priest, former Church of England priest, joined the Catholic Church, and she's a Catholic blogger. She's fairly prominent in blogging conservative Catholic circles. The police came to her home and would rest at her while she was making dinner in front of her children, seized all of her computers and uh, communications equipment, took her into jail, interrogated her, you know, took what made her remove all her, her engagement wing, her wedding wing, her crucifix, all this and that. And essentially, she was accused of hurting the feelings of a transvestite somewhere, somehow. Now, she's been engaged in vigorous debate with transgender activists, but now because she's allegedly hurt the feelings of people and was further accused of posting under a pseudonym certain, certain posts that were deemed offensive by the police, she was taken and questioned by the police for violating uh, the human rights and civil rights of gender activists. It's very similar in its optics as to the rest of the uh, Catholic father in uh, Philadelphia uh, last week, mm -hmm. where the police are, by their own uh, volition, are uh, taking people with uh, unpopular uh, views into preventative political detention. Um, it's, it's horrific. It's horrific in that there is no... Uh, there's a favoritism of certain speech and a punishment of other speech. Now, in the United States, that is impossible. Uh, I mean, e now, doesn't mean people don't try, but it's just is not going to happen where the authorities, except for the FBI, of course, will not enforce uh, rules against unpopular speech. 
But in Britain, there are no, we don't have, Brit, the British don't have the civil liberties that we do in the United States. In Canada, they don't have the civil liberties that we have as regards to free speech. Well, and, I, but I, I, let me back up here. Here in America, in academia, we don't have that uh, free speech rights anymore. In academia, mm -hmm. which I spoke to in, in the 70s and 80s, was the place you would get up and stand up and, and give an opinion and receive an opinion and share opinions. A professor uh, at, a, I forget which university, sorry, wasn't paying attention that much, was fired because he said, hey, listen, it would really help society if not just white people didn't say the N-word, but if we just kind of banned it from all rap. Boom. Oh, you're out of a job there, son. And, you know, he was an expressing opinion. Nobody uh, countered his opinion. They just fired him. That's not well, how the we most, do things. Yeah. The, the most racist institutions today are the universities yeah. and academia. The University of Chicago is having a forum on race. White people are excluded from this discussion. Um, there are uh, black black only dorms on most university campuses where whites may not seek and may not live uh we we've gone back to this times of segregation yeah. Yeah. even before the 60s and mm -hmm. it's now not all and the thing is it this is not being pushed there are some black activists at the top of the totem who make all these noises pushed by white liberals it's not blacks who are being racist, it's whites being racist against other rights on behalf of blacks. Kanye West, uh, who is the world famous blogger, entrepreneur, he has a clothing line, he's, he's quite a character. He and Candace Owen, who, who is also African American, uh, went to a Paris fashion show where West was uh, unveiling some new product lines. And they both wore t -shirt, white t-shirts that said, white lives matter. And they immediately have been savaged for by liberal whites white for liberals, racism. Yeah. Yeah. White liberals. And of course, you've got, you know, the BLM activist types, but they are no more representative of the African American community than the Ku Klux Klan is of the white community. But white liberals are taking Kanye West to task for being a racist by saying white lives matter. Um, it's a screwy world in which we live. Yeah, well, it happened. I mean, this it's not new. It happened six or seven years ago. Uh, I don't know if you have cable TV. I used to have cable TV. I've cut the cord now. I used to watch HGTV in the morning on Saturday. We get up with coffee, and this is before we owned an RV, and we uh, we just you know had three kids, and you get your coffee, you watch a little HGTV, and Fixer Upper was on. It was the uh, uh, a couple in their thirties and forties who would go around in a little Texas town called Waco and and fix up properties. And they were famous. They did a great job. They happened to be Christian. They happened to be evangelical Christian. And one day, some activists said, well, what church did they go to? They Googled it. They started watching the videos. Oh, my Lord. They're homophobes because of what's being taught at the church. Guilty by association. And so they put out these horrible press releases about the, uh, this couple. And uh, Chris and Joanne Gaines. Gaines? Chip, Gaines. Chip and Joanna Gaines. Yep, Chip sorry. and Joanna Gaines. Yep, long time ago. Uh, and uh, put out a press release, and we were waiting for what Chip and Joanna were going to say. And what they said was, you know, in this world where people are trying to divide us, we want to let you know that we're not. Yes, we go to church. Yes, we worship. Uh, and... Um, please don't try and find things about us that are going to divide the world, but try to find things about us that are going to uh, unite the world. And after that, it was a great press release. After that, not a, not a peep. Actually, there's a continuation of that story. Uh oh, the discovery more peeps? <laughs> the, okay. uh, Home and Garden is owned by a corporate, you know, Yes, and it, it's not its own freestanding entity. Yeah. And they were lobbied to dump these people, the Gaineses. Sure. Well, they, mm -hmm. well, here's the glory of the American capitalist market system. They went out and started their own network. Mm -hmm. And now they're not on HDTV anymore. They're not on the Discovery Network. They're on the Magnolia Network, yep. which they started. And they have their own shows. They have their own magazine. They have their own products. They allowed the market to decide, is it worth watching these people? Is it worth 
buying the, the products that they sell and they weren't uh, trampled by the executives at Walt Disney or whoever happened to own the network at the time. But, you know, this week we have a Chip and Joganic gain story, but it's down in Australia. A man named Andrew Thornburn uh, was uh, engaged as the president or manager of the, uh, the Essendon Bombers, an AFL, Australian Football League team. He, too, attends an evangelical church and gay activists in Australia said, oh my goodness, he's a homophobe because his minister said this and minister recorded the uh, sermon and posted it on the internet. And he's uh, on their, the equivalent of their vestry. Therefore, he must be a racist, bigoted, homophobe, Trump voting, gun toting, mega person down in uh, the suburbs of Melbourne. Down under, yeah, geez. And well, a day later, he was forced out of his job. And, he, and here's the thing, the premier of Victoria, the state in Australia this is located, felt it was his obligation to call the Christianity practiced, I think it's the Church on the Hill, uh, is the name of the congregation, abhorrent. Well, at what point did Australian politics decide that they had a right to comment on the theological uh, veracities of a congregation? But here, a premier is able to jump in and savage. And this is all private business, private business. There's no government money that I know of. No. Yet, yet here is, well, maybe. Now, he can't go out and form his own football league. It's not like the Gaineses where he can go out. <laughs> and no. I, I know, I have, I have, you, Kevin, you and I have friends who want, who've gone through the corporate world. And at a certain point, they knock. Uh, they're not going to go any higher, and they're basically told it's because, well, we need a woman for this job, or we need a minority for this job, and you've reached the point. And most of these guys leave and start their own businesses, or do, you know, go out and find another way forward because the ladder at IBM or at GE is closed. And it's not black people who are causing that, white liberals white who are liberals. saying, yeah. saying, oh, well, we need to have 10% you know, of our executives be this, 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 and this. Merit be damned. Uh, you know, length of service be damned. We want to be able to tell our shareholders or our uh, uh, the, 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 our uh, friends at the country club that well, uh, we promote these yeah. guys. Yeah. You know, multicultural. Yeah. So, you know... Yeah, it, it, yeah. I, well, go back to how I introduced this. It's not the fault of the white liberal. It's not the fault uh, uh, of the... It's our fault for not saying no soon enough. We should have said, we, here's what we're doing. You know, we're acting like Germans uh, in, in, outside of Auschwitz. It's going to happen to us if we don't wake up. You know? Well, there are some churches that are saying no. Um, and it's coming down into critical race theory. Bishop, where where basically uh, critical race theory teaches essentially that in Christ there is black and white, uh, privileged and unprivileged. There may be no slave, no Jew, slave, no free, Greek, no Jew, male, nor female, but we have new categories where these people are preferred over others. Well, and this well, is being taught. It's, it's, it's taught to the point where if you're a white person, you pray differently than a black person. If you're a black person, you read the Bible differently than a white person. That your lived experience, that my lived experience trumps everything else. Yeah. Um, and there is, there was a faction within the uh, the a a ACNA that was really hot to trot with this, including a bishop. Uh, releasing videos and statements of support, including uh, canon theologians of dioceses uh, saying that, well, because you're white, you just don't understand. Yeah. And therefore, I have a trump card to play against you in all arguments. This is unchristian. This is heretical. This is anti-gospel. And Bishop Ray Sutton of the REC and um, put out a statement about a year and a half, two years ago, I think it was. Mm -hmm. With COVID, I've lost track of time. I me too. But Ray, Sut but Ray Sutton smacked this down. And I'm told, but I'm not told because it was in confidence, but uh, that, that the recent conclave 
was talking about this hmm. that we are we in the acna need to be a gospel organization and not one driven by culture and by driven by the latest pseudo intellectual fads of failed academics but we need to proclaim jesus christ and the equality of all people before god yeah so well, the acna and i'm going to hold up ray sutton because he did a dangerous thing he spoke the truth against the mob shouts of the mob he said no Bishop Ray Sutton of the REC said, no, no, no. In fact, when you read the Bible, there's only two distinguishing facts that divide us. You either read the Bible as a believer or as a non-believer. That's, that's it. You, you, well, I, what about my race? Mm, maybe your culture, but I, I know white uh, Africans from Kenya and they read the Bible as an Af you know as a Kenyan. I know you know it, it just <laughs> so. And, the, and when we had all this furore over removing uh, uh, William Portia, Portia Du Bois from the cat from the electionary of the Episcopal Church because his fam he was a, the greatest Episcopal theologian of the nineteenth century. Yeah, nineteenth century, uh, Professor at Swanee. His family, before the Civil War, owned slaves. And because of that, he was deemed a non-person by the recent General Convention. The Archbishop of Rwanda uh, spoke about this and said, this is ludicrous. We cannot, you know, judge a man's theological worth based upon his family's financial holdings. Um, you know, this is not how the gospel works. So. You know, we have Ray Sutton, we have African Anglicans, not all of them, far from it. African Anglicans speaking out against us. We have Catholic leaders, we have Lutheran and Methodist leaders, but we have just as many Lutheran, Methodist, Episcopal, and an Anglican bishop who will speak in favor of racism and bigotry and race hatred mm -hmm. as uh, espoused by CRT advocates. Yeah, I think Bill Maher said, you know, we are fools to look back in history 1022 and uh, and alike and judge it with the eyes and knowledge we have in 2022 you know that that that, that doesn't work and i want to, to further that we're foolish because we are judged through the gospel we're not judged through uh, the lens of 2022 yeah the, the church of england's had dealing with this issue there was justin welby's unfortunate intervention at a cambridge college where they wanted to take down a memorial to uh, uh a man who had uh, allegedly made his money out of slavery and was a ma major benefactor of the college and the college said oh could he let's show our our liberal liberal credential and take down this statue well uh the church consistory court said no you can't do that and Justin Welby intervened and said, oh, they should do it. And the Welby was smacked down. And the judge basically pointed out that if we only allowed people who had no sin and no blemishes, there'd be no memorials in church. Well, the message didn't seem to get across to the Diocese of Bristol, where a parish that was supported by a man named I think Edward Colston. Uh, well, in the 17th century, uh, he was involved in the transatlantic slave trade, and he had donated money to to a cathedral, to the church. They, they threw his, activists threw his statue into the river in Bristol. And a church was given permission to take down a window honoring his memory for having helped build the church. And in its place, this Church of England parish put in a glass window of Jesus on a migrant boat with all these brown-skinned people heading to England. In other words, England is going through this illegal immigrant problem where they're crossing in boats from France because the welfare benefits in England are better in France. Much so better, these are, yes. So all the, so these people are trying to get to England to safety. No, not for safety. They're safe in France. They're safe in yeah. Germany. They're safe yeah. in Holland. Mm -hmm. But it's you get more cash in England. And this Church of England parish has put in a window saying this is what Jesus would do. you got to wonder who... Kevin, you, well, you sent me an article about some church in Wisconsin that was just as screwy. Yes. Um, well, but, but hold on. In fairness, 
we are told as Christians in, in Judeo-Christian tense, when we are confronted with a, an immigrant, illegal or whatever, we treat them as you know uh, royalty. In, in all fairness, what we're talking about here is our which is why family. Governor DeSantis <laughs> sent them to Martha's Vineyard. That's right. They, uh, oh, he okay, treats okay, them much right. better than me. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm a, I voted for him. I pay yeah, taxes yeah. in the state, property but taxes in the state. I, we don't have I, income tax. I, I hate. But to I never get sent on vacation. Never. I know, and I hate to introduce theology here on Anglican Scripta, but uh, you know the theology behind immigration is when you are uh, meet an immigrant. Uh, you are to do everything for them, the shirt off your back. Um, but your government, according to Romans, is allowed to have policies. And if your government has borders, and as we found all throughout the Old and New Testament, um, there's nothing wrong with borders and, and having uh, the ability to control a, a nation space. Nothing wrong with that. And we have uh, not open borders, but we have immigration allowed into this country. I know several European countries that don't allow immigration. And we, we need we're to treated, distinguish we're treated, from, Yeah, go ahead. I, I just want to say we need to distinguish something that took many, many years to get through my children's head. Okay. The difference between I want something and I need something. Need, want, need, absolutely. Okay, yeah. in other words, people may want to come to the United States, but do they need to come to the United States? And some do. Now, now there are political prisoners from other, other countries who we have designed laws where they can apply at the embassy and get in here. We've been doing that for uh, all through the Cold War. No big deal. Uh, so, yes, we have legal immigration and legal um, ways to uh, attain uh, temporary or full citizenship in this country coming from anywhere in the world except maybe north no, north korea too so all right we, we've hit that subject well, to actually, death. I, yeah well actually i think we should talk about the fact that uh, caroline farrow probably could go to the u.s embassy in london right. and and ask make an application for political asylum due mm -hmm. to per political persecution yeah it because just, there's no other way to explain what's going on to her uh, it's it's horrible mention that you had the same denomination as per uh, president joseph biden it'll probably get you in you know except okay. if you do come to america don't go to california because you mm -hmm. but you go to florida or florida. texas mm -hmm. you know someplace where you'll be safe all right hey let's do some crazy news the dalai lama dalai lama is afraid his successor will be picked by chinese hacks and he's threatened not to what's the word they use be reincarnated he threatens not to be reincarnated I don't know if he has control over that, but apparently he has control over that, George. Oh, it's a wonderful story, and it tells me who reads headlines and who reads articles yes. when we publish stories on Anglican Inc. The Dalai Lama is the head of the Tibetan people and the Tibetan Buddhist leader, and each he's the 13th of the 14th Dalai Lama, 13th Dalai Lama, I believe. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. No. This is always a wonderful opportunity for people to say, oh, you idiot, you didn't know he was 14, not 13. <laughs> no, well, no, half the audience is going, wait, his name is not Dolly? <laughs> no, no. They know about him from Bill Murray and Caddyshack. Uh, <laughs> That's right. That the Dalai Lama, you know, likes to go golfing, and Bill sure. Murray was his caddy. Uh -huh. Well, Dalai Lama is in his late 80s, 89, I think. And when the Dalai Lama dies, according to Tibetan tradition and religious lore, a new Dalai Lama is reincarnated in the form of a young child who's born roughly with, around the time he dies. The Dalai Lama is deathly afraid that the Chinese communists will appoint, the CCP will appoint a new Dalai Lama at his death to basically fully subjugate the Tibetan people. This is a religious freedom story. So the Dalai Lama is saying, I may not be reincarnated this time, and it may be 50, 25 years until the next Dalai Lama is chosen by the, the Lamas in Lhasa in Tibet. Well, what he's saying is that he's giving a veiled threat to the Chinese that God, uh, the Buddhist God, I don't know what you call God and Buddha, but will There's not a, reincarnate there me. There isn't a Buddhist God, is there? Hold on. I, I don't. <laughs> okay, we're getting out of my comfort zone of knowledge. <laughs> okay. Uh, I may not be reincarnated in time for you to appoint my successor. And this is a, a story about 
religious freedom in China, where the Dalai Lama is basically fudging the rules of Tibetan Buddhism to prevent the Chinese from taking over the country completely. But and the Uyghurs, the Muslims in uh, West uh, West Turkestan, East Turkestan, are in concentration camps or detention camps, being forcibly uh, turned into model Chinese Communist Party citizens. And what's being lost in all this uh, no press reporting about the Uyghurs is the heightened persecution of Christians. It's as bad. It's almost. It's not at the cultural revolution levels or the levels meet in the early fifties after the uh, Chinese march, march uh, down the streets and shooting them. Yeah, but pastors of uh, house churches are being disappeared. They're being arrested. Uh, they're disappearing into the Chinese gulag. Uh, they're being arrested on spurious charges. Uh, they're being laid at cult activists and. Um, and the official Chinese churches, the Three Self Patriotic Movement, and the Catholic Church in China, are seeing that their leaders being totally controlled by the party, such that the uh, the, the new leader of the Catholic Patriotic Church, who is recognized by Rome as a valid Catholic bishop, is basically saying that uh, we need to look to the party, not to the Gospels, not to the Bible, for our social ethics. Indeed, and. In the official Chinese Protestant churches, some of them, it depends upon the local state government, because some are more active and vigorous, are replacing you know the Ten Commandments with sayings of Chairman Mao, and now Chairman Xi, the current leader. It's a bad time for Christians, public Christians. Last two, three years, we went through a period of church demolitions. Now we're going through the starting a period of clergy demolitions. And when they're done with the clergy, they'll move to the simple believer. Now, I, I don't want to equate this in any way, but we have per, you know extreme persecution going on in China, and now for the first time in a long time, we have persecution of Christians going on in the West. You know, we had relative safety for you know, maybe two hundred years, and that safety's gone. And once again, I don't want to equate this, but you know, the 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 demonic. Uh, persecution of Christians is, is, is happening worldwide now. It's not something that's just limited to China, North Korea, and, and some other countries. Uh, it's being done on a social level in almost every country. Where you are persecuted in one way, shape, or form for what you believe in. I want to, I hate to do this again, go into Revelation. And one of the signs of the Antichrist and the Beast is only the people who follow the Beast can operate in commerce. And we're not too far from that. Well, this is this this is the same thing as our previous story about Andrew Thornburn in uh, Melbourne, Caroline Farrow in the UK. They're being persecuted, actively persecuted, and in fact arrested and losing their jobs for being Christian, for holding Christian worldviews. You know, I had an email from a, a viewer saying, "George, what's going to happen when they come for you? You said that the FBI was corrupt and the Biden administration." was doing bad things in our last show, are they going to arrest you? And I said, oh, no. Um, they don't arrest people like me. They arrest working-class blue-collar people who are not... I may be... I may be I may, I'm a member of the establishment. I just happen to be a class traitor. Yeah. And they've not gotten around to getting people like me. They're getting those who uh, don't have friends in high places. Um, and he says, well, watch out. Uh, that's how the French Revolution went. You know, they start with the obvious targets, then they yeah. get the fellow travelers. But no, I don't think it can happen in the United States. Um, but again, that's I'm looking at the past, and who would have predicted the present from our past? Yeah. Uh, it will happen. Did you spill your coffee on your pants, did you? Yeah, yeah, I, I dumped it on the carpet, you know, so I'm trying to wipe it up while doing the show. So well, here's the biggest problem, though. We're now to the point where the the moderate middle class is not saying no. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the Christians obviously are saying no. The, the Caroline, uh, Caroline Farrells are saying no. But uh, I need the, the average church person to start saying no again. The average moderate on the street to start saying no. And if that doesn't happen... Uh, what ha what has you know confused hist historical uh, scholars uh, for eons is why do people allow for such genocide to happen across the street from their houses? Um, Kevin, I 
Yeah. I I don't want to sound like a booster of the United States, um, but people are saying no. Uh, Kamala Harris, or Kamala Harris, she says it both ways, and we've had people be mad at us for finding it, pronouncing it one way or another. Mm -hmm. Vice President Harris has said that hurricane aid in the wake of Ian should be based on race. And this has gone over like a lead balloon in Florida. Black leaders, white, black clergy, white leaders, uh, the governor, the whole spectrum of politics have said, what are you crazy? This is as un-American a thing as you can imagine. People are saying no. Now, it may be easy to say no to Kamala Harris because she's such a buffoon or Joe Biden, but uh, can you say no to your employer? Uh, can you who uh, can you say no to uh, your bishop? It's harder. Maybe it's because the government's far away, and we only see him when the mail comes. To to be uh, be a rebel. <laughs> I, 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 I do think people will say no. Yeah, and I, I, I hope so. That is my prayer. Um, okay, we we do need to move around uh, along here. We're we're wasting some time. Not wasting time. We're using our time properly. Um, let's just do it. Cuckoo for no, Cocoa We're Pops. wasting our your time. <laughs> we're wasting, your, we're time wasting your time, not ours. We enjoy uh, this. Yes. Okay. Leader of the Russian Orthodox Church, Kirill. We have an update. Uh, well, the update I have written down here is Cuckoo for Cocoa Pops. Uh, but yeah. Putin gave a speech on <laughs> September. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Putin gave a speech on September 30th and says that affirmed again that this is a religious war and inferred that the West is Satan. Uh, therefore, this is a religious holy war that he's fighting. And there's and if you're in a holy war, George, what's wrong with bringing out the nukes? What's wrong with the nukes? Our defense and foreign policy establishment, the people who brought us Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, who've had basically 50 years of continued failures of processes, uh, except for Henry Kissinger, things have been pretty darn bad. Uh, and, well, that's, that's too strong. Uh, Mike, Pen uh, Mike Pompeo was pretty good. And, but, you know, let's go back to the days of Henry Kissinger. Mm -hmm. Well, on September 30, Vladimir Putin gave a speech where he basically told the Russian people this was a holy war, that this was a war against West, the West in Ukraine, that Ukraine was overrun with Nazis and fascists and, and agents of Satan, and they seek to destroy holy Russia. Now, this ties in to what Kirill said la a week ago Sunday, where he gave a sermon saying those who would die in the service of this cause against the satanic forces of the West will have their sins washed away. We've had people write to us and say their local Orthodox bishops have said, don't pay any attention to what Kirill's saying because that's not Orthodox theology. We don't have a theory of indulgences and it actually sounds more like Islam that if you die in jihad, you go to straight to heaven as a martyr. Well, Russia our foreign policy establishment doesn't understand religion. And they don't understand it in the case of Iran. They don't understand it in the case of Russia. Or Israel. In Iran, or is uh, uh, Ahmad, Ahmadinejad, the yeah. former uh, Iranian prime minister, uh, who was a layperson, layman, was a religious zealot who believed that the use of nuclear weapons would hasten the return of the hidden imam and that the apocalypse would come and it was part of Iran's job with nuclear weapons to hasten that final battle between Satan and um, uh, Christ, uh, Jesus, because Jesus would be coming back uh, in the Muslim worldview. Uh, and at that time, the Iranians didn't have it. The, Rush the mullahs who replaced Ahmadinejad hold that same view. And when they threaten Israel with the bomb, they're not doing it just to extort concessions out of people. As soon as they have a bomb ready, they have said they're going to use it against Israel to destroy the little Satan and then engage the great Satan, which is the United States, because this is an article of their faith. Now, in Russia, we have Vladimir Putin preaching a form of religious nationalism with a tinge of millenarianism 
that Russia, mu- for Russia, a Western Ukraine is as great a threat as a missiles in Cuba were for John F. Kennedy in the United States. And it caused, you know, we were ready to go to war with Russia over missiles in Cuba and have a nuclear war. And we're at as dangerous a time today with the Ukraine as we were in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Problem is, we don't have some of the wisdom of John F. Kennedy and uh, his advisors in the White House. We have Joe Biden being led by who knows who, you know, being led by the hand by somebody. We don't know who. And Vladimir sees this in apocalyptic terms. And it's not, and here's one of the things I wanted to add it. In reading the Russian press, there's a great deal of opposition to Vladimir Putin. Uh, not everybody back buys this. Uh, but there are people who do. The Pentecostal churches in Russia, which have been persecuted by the Orthodox churches for as long as they can remember, are, many of them are backing Vladimir Putin. So they see this worldview in the same way. And here's the scary thing. Our elites are talking about, well, if they use nuclear weapons, we'll hit them back this way. My friends, it doesn't work that way. Once you use the bomb, you know, it's like being a little pregnant. It's not a little pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. We either have devastation around the world. It's like October 1914, uh, August 1914, in the world today where you know one little incident can trigger the mobilization of armies and a clash you know if ukraine joins nato for instance that means the u.s must by treaty engage engage in active conflict with russia and we have nancy pelosi and company saying we should we should let them join nato and teach vladimir putin a lesson well vladimir putin's not going to go quietly into the night if he believes this is an issue of heaven and hell well, he says it's an issue. I don't know what he believes. You know, every every leader in, in the United States, every president I've seen get up and try to lead their side by saying things that they don't believe. And so I, I, I would not put it against Putin that he does truly does not believe this. He's trying to win a war, and he's trying to uh, raise up some troops. So yeah, yeah, but if this is the ideology you're using, I mean, yeah, nobody no, I, believed. Uh, he he he's Adolf, in. Nobody believed. He, he, nobody believed Adolf Hitler when he yeah. said that uh, the the Jews were parasites and a cancer, and we want to get we they must be exterminated. No. Nobody he, believed in the final solution until there was evidence in '43 that was incontrovertible. Yeah. Incontrovertible. No, it I, couldn't be challenged. It couldn't be challenged. But here he has brought this to be a holy war. And holy wars uh, have uh, more veracity to them to, than your gener- but generic world war. Where, so. where I want to go, Kip, to push this is it wasn't Adolf Hitler who dropped the pills that gassed the people. It wasn't Adolf Hitler mm-hmm. who machine gunned the people in the villages. It were the so- it was the soldiers and policemen who believed the ideology that the Jews were destroying the Aryan race, and it was either us or them. And therefore, they were willing and could intellectualize and moralize mass murder because of their ideology. It's not Vladimir Putin. Well, he will push one button, but it's a guy in a missile silo who will, who will push the launch. It'll be a general who will issue the order to drop, uh, you know, tactical nuclear weapons from artillery. And it's because they sh- they're the ideology, the, uh, which in this case is religiously tinged tells them this is the morally right thing to do. And that's uh, why I'm so frightened for the future of Europe, um, for the future of the world. Oh, my God is unshaken. But yeah, I, I can see a, a, a time in the future, if things go worse, and it's certainly been a bad decade, uh, where we have to worry about uh, nuclear fallout, something that you and I, something you and I had to worry about in the seventies, has returned after the Cold War. But here, here there's, there was there's a school of history that says you know forces of history they're inevitable. You can't people don't matter. Well, uh, Rocket Man, as Donald Trump called him, fired a missile yesterday that flew over Tokyo from North Korea, causing four and a half million Tokyo citizens to be ordered into air raid shelters. The first time that's been happened since 1945, where the people of Tokyo have to go into air raid shelters. Mm -hmm. 
when Donald Trump was president, whatever you may think of his personality and what he says about women and his mean tweets, there was no danger from North Korea under Trump's time because Trump knew how to nego negotiate and work with people. The seizure of the Ukraine came under Obama, under Obama. Trump's time. Obama? But, Biden? Yes. Biden. No, no, no. The seizure of the Ukraine came under okay. Obama. Seizures oh, of yeah, yeah, Eastern, yeah. Okay. Yes, okay. I seizures that, yeah. of Eastern Ukraine sure. yeah. came under Biden. And why was that? Because Putin took the calculation that I'm not going to fight with this guy because he's, you know, you, you, you make rational calculations as the strength of your adversaries. And when you have a weak, doddering leader, um, that's when you strike. When you know that there's no realistic, uh, op you know, possibility of hitting back. So, people do matter. Leadership does matter. Um, and, and look at England, for instance. They have a new prime minister, Liz Truss, who basically caved to the, you know, the BBC and members of the English House of Bishops and did a U-turn on tax cuts. Well, tax cuts are the only way to grow the economy in England, and she did basically what margaret thatcher would not have done <laughs> she well, caved the, the, mob. the thing the tax cuts in, in the benefit of doing it in britain is you subvert the european union uh right now the european union's uh telling the bbc if, if this happens you guys will collapse it's just the opposite you will have uh a a better functioning economy than the european union uh, but i want to go back to leaders matter yes because right now everybody under 40 in the Biden administration has no memory of communism, has no memory of the Cold War, has no memory of the evils uh, that uh, uh, Marxism and communism uh, just sustained on our world for uh, the centuries. And, and they, those over 75, like Joe Biden, who have no memory of yesterday <laughs> the, yes. and what they had for breakfast, they don't remember <laughs> either. And so, you know, th there is this, this history we've lost in the knowledge of the evil of socialism and then the evil of marxism and the evil of communism we, we've lost that and mm -hmm. without that that shared knowledge um we're to the point now where uh who is our leader it, it may be the person who uh puts us in, into a losing situation um and if, if nuclear fallout happens uh, over in uh the, the ukraine russian theater uh, it very well could be what happened uh, as precipitous of the White House. So, little an little anecdote. Uh, okay. Well, we're, in, we're running uh, over time here, so let, let, let's 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 we'll, we'll skip the last stories and do them Friday. So we'll finish with your anecdote. Nineteen thirty-nine. Many Hasidic Jews in Poland welcomed the uh, presence of Adolf Hitler in Germany because they believed that he would usher in the era the Messiah. In other words, Hitler, who would go on to kill almost all the Jews of Poland, was welcomed by some because it was the trigger they saw for the return of uh, the Messiah. Well, it didn't happen. And instead, it led to the deaths of, what, 95, 90% 90 of Polish Jewry. People will do things for religious reasons that may make no sense. And when you, have, when you calculate politics based on that, uh, that religion plays no importance. You're just being foolish. Well, I hope we left you with an exciting Anglican unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode X number 763 of Anglican Unscripted.